presence so much. We cannot live without His presence. That's our strength this morning. And we want to continue to worship Him as we say, King of glory, come and have your place.
Oh, 
lift our voices. We make it one.
bow our hearts before Him in absolute purity of heart, purity of mind, and purity of body, uh, purity of motive, purity in honor, purity in obedience, purity in attitude. Because God respects and honors purity. And the cry of this chorus is the cry of our hearts, a pure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. Something about purity that is so uh, magnetically attractive from God's vantage point to the person. Purity of heart. God hates impurity at any level. But God loves cleanness. God loves purity. God loves transparency. God hates duplicity. God hates hypocrisy. God hates carnality. God hates lasciviousness. God hates corruption. But He loves purity. Just lift your hands. Re finest fire my heart. My heart's one desire is to be Choose to be holy, set apart for you, my master, ready to do your way. Make it your prayer, refine this fire, refine this fire. Purify us this morning in ways that only he, he knows how. But God does expect pure vessels, holy conduits that transmit grace, power, and even the person of the Holy Spirit. That's why he's called holy. He's not just a spirit, he's Holy Spirit. Holiness befits him. Holiness is intrinsically woven into everything that's why he's so sensitive he's a holy spirit amen lift up your hand to just thank him just tell him you are holy spirit you are not an unholy spirit you are holy spirit just allow him to purify you of any dross and carnality just allow his fire to refine you as pure gold Lord, I will bow to you, to no other gods, but you alone. Lord, I will. Lord, I will worship you. Nothing hands have made, but you alone. Sing it again. Oh, 
Receive the Spirit of the Lord this morning. A Spirit that will redeem you. A Spirit that will cleanse you and purify you. Purify your heart and your mind from the things that keep you in bondage. Purify the generations that will come out of you. Purify the people around you. Because your presence will have the same impact that the presence of the Lord has on your life. We worship you this morning, Father, and we thank you. We acknowledge you, we remember you, and we receive you in Jesus' name. Well, good morning, family. I trust that you are all well. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in Spirit, intent on one purpose. 
Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for interest, the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and, and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of, the God, of God the Father. And then we all know this portion that we read in the prayer meeting yesterday. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in the presence only, my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You may take your seats. It's so amazing how when God wants to work, he dovetails everything together. In this portion of scripture, Paul encourages us, those he writes to, to be more like Christ. And he highlights some things. He highlights the fact that we need to have the same mind, the same love, one spirit, and be after one purpose. And in verse 3, he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit but have the attitude that was in Christ, obedient even to the point of death. From what we just sung and, and what Pastor highlighted about purity, a thought dropped into my spirit um, that reminded me of something that was dropped into my spirit. And that is the fact that we have to constantly be in a spirit of prayer. And I believe for my life personally, that is the only way I can keep myself pure. How many of you watched the movie The Avengers? And uh, there was a scene where there was an attack and Bruce Banner needed to turn into the Hulk. And someone said to him, now it's time to get angry. And he said, that's my secret. I'm always angry. So whenever the attack comes against you, you're always prepared. You're always in a position where you don't need to do anything to get yourself to a place where you can now fend for yourself. And by constantly being in a spirit of prayer, the moment you come to a point where um, you may be faced with an impure thought or an act or a desire or whatever it is, something that will work against your brother, you are already in a spirit of prayer and that will protect and preserve you. Mm. In yesterday's prayer meeting, Pastor Randolph confirmed something that uh, was in my mind. And at 2 a.m. yesterday, I woke up with this thought of first the natural, then the spiritual. And for some time, I had a specific view on the matter. And when we spoke about the story of Ishmael and Isaac, Pastor highlighted to us that sometimes the things we produce in the flesh may not be recognized in the heavens or the eternal. But also, that we should never allow our natural experiences or limitations to determine how we attain spiritual blessings or even fulfill spiritual purpose and the promise that God has for your life. And God gave me a word for the house. And I've said this before, that when I speak, it's not me speaking to you. Mm. It's me relaying a story that God has said for my life. It's me relaying the messages that God has given to me personally. And the word was this. Shift your focus away from the processes, from your processes of being crucified and begin to function in your resurrected power and ascended reality. Mm. Don't function like you are living in the consequences of your past sin and hurt and failures and so on. Mm. Live like you are a firstborn son of God, joint heir with Christ, 
the one who died to free you from the very things that keep you in bondage. Be like Christ. Same mind, same love, one spirit, one purpose. Bring ourselves to a point of obedience to fulfill God's purpose and don't give too much attention on the difficulty of the process. When Paul says in verse 3, without selfishness or empty conceit, we need to understand that selfishness is not only lateral. Selfishness does not only refer to me being selfish with the people around me. Selfishness also refers to me being selfish with my plans and God's plans. Mm. Sometimes we feel it's about what we want to go through, what we believe we need to spend time on. Selfishness can be about you and God. If I decide I need so many months to deal with my personal issues and neglect the plans and purpose and the will of God, that's selfishness. Mm. I don't miss what I'm saying because what we go through naturally is necessary. Mm. We need to. We need to go through hurt. We need to go through pain and suffering because the scripture says that first the natural and then the spiritual. So in order to function and receive a resurrected power and ascended life, you have to go through the natural circumstances first. But what we cannot do is elevate those natural uh, experience to overshadow spiritual processes. 1 Corinthians 5.46 says that the first Adam was a living soul and the last Adam was a life-giving spirit. The, resu the resurrected body is achieved through a natural life, being born, living, and dying. So this morning, I just want to encourage you to focus on the end. And then you realize that the process becomes a necessary means. When we consider the table, we need to always remember the Lord's death. And I said this before, and I'll keep saying it, that when we remember his death, when we publicly proclaim his death, we remember why he died. And when we remember why he died, we then acknowledge why he was sent. He was sent to redeem us and reconcile us to a spiritual father. And he was sent in the natural, in the flesh. So this morning I want to encourage you to focus on your purpose. You know, sometimes I believe that God doesn't reveal our individual purposes in life to us because we may detract from the corporate one. Our corporate purpose on the earth is to make manifest God. Genesis 1, 26, let us make man in our image. So the more we focus on what we are here for, the less time we will spend on the things that bring us down. The less experiences we will go through where we are so deterred that we might not even come back to God. God is able to redeem the time, but he can only do so if you live in his spirit. All the things that you have lost, God can redeem if you live in his spirit. So this morning as we come to the the table. Let us take these emblems and consider why Christ was sent, consider why he died for us, and consider what your corporate purpose on the earth is. Let us pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus and we thank you that we can receive freely from your throne. We thank you for your spirit of grace, a grace that gives us more than we can ask more than we can think or even comprehend. We do not take this spirit, we do not take this grace for granted. So Father, we pray this morning that you give us the strength to put the fleshly things beneath the spiritual ones. Mm -hmm. We pray, Lord, and we ask for your spirit daily to keep our lives pure, to keep our hearts pure, our minds pure, so that we will not be distracted, that we will not be taken off the path, that we will not be removed from the light, and the light will not dim within our lives. I pray for each heart that is bowed here this morning, 
that you will bring such a sense of peace into their lives, Father God, that whatever it is they are facing, they know that they have a God, a Father, who has them in mind. So as we remember the Lord's death, we know, Father God, why we are here, and we focus on that. So we give you all praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may partake. to the Lord our tithes, offerings, and first fruits. Saturate me in your anointing. My Jesus. Saturate me in your presence. I need more of you. I got to have more of your Saturate me, Lord, today. Saturate me in your anointing, my Jesus. Saturate me in your presence. I need more of you. I've got to have more of your.
saturate me in your presence. I need more of you. I've got to have those who have given thank you for your presence thank you for the sense of your anointing the sense of your person here with us be with us continue to speak with us and fill us anew in jesus name There's no better place to be than to be saturated in God's presence. I'm so excited. I feel like in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit came and flooded the atmosphere and filled every life. And he's here today. So let's give the Holy Spirit a hand this morning. Amen. A warm welcome to the house. It's so wonderful to see each one of you. A special welcome to our visitors. And when I call your name, if you can just stand, and we want to just give you a warm Gate Ministries DC welcome. Uh, Sega Queen, if you can stand, please. Welcome, Sega Queen. It's wonderful to have you with us. Bless you. George? George's son. Uh, oh, George's spiritual son from Bloemfontein. She's got a project in Durban for the next few months, so it's wonderful to have you with us. And then we have Charmaine Naidu and Santigo, mum and son, who are friends of Wesley Joseph in Port Shepston. If you can stand up. <laughs> Welcome, Santigo and mum, Charmaine. Oh, she's coming back now. Okay, welcome. This is your father's house, so feel relaxed. We are all part of the family of God. A special welcome again to Auntie Ruth. Auntie Ruth is a spiritual son of Pastor Rosh and Mervyn. Stand, Auntie Ruth. Good to have you again. Wonderful. She is just so precious to us. And her daughter, Chantal, who's now part of our house. Chantal, if you can stand again with your two babas. It's so wonderful to have you with us. And... Uh, yeah, we, we know that the, the, when you're spiritual family, you're connected. You don't have to have the same biological, natural blood, but spiritually we are connected because God is our Father. So I think that divine DNA is even better than the natural and biological. But bless you all and the announcements for this week. Uh, on Wednesday, okay, firstly tonight, there will be no foundation series this week. Sunday and Thursday and the following Sunday, there won't be any foundation series. The next foundation series Bible study will continue on Thursday, the 16th of March. Okay, so still be in a, a spirit of prayer and still be in a spirit of studying the Word of God and growing and having family devotions with your family. But we will be having house church. And so um, on Wednesday evening this week, there is house church. We have the six house churches, and if you are 
one of the, the new part of the new families and you are not yet in a house church, please see me afterwards and we will allocate you to the house church in your area. House church is all via Zoom from 7 to 8 o'clock. It's just one hour. And what we will be doing in house church is that the message today, if you can take notes and listen attentively, we discuss that in the house church. We dissect it. We pull it apart. And everyone has a contribution. Even if it's one sentence you need to say, you can just share what stood out for you from the word. You can ask a question if you need clarity. You can share what you feel God is saying to you through the word. It's just a wonderful time of sharing. It's like we lay a table and everybody brings their dish to the table. And at the end, by eight o'clock, we are full of spiritual food. So I want to encourage you. There's many families that aren't attending house church. If you can please Make every effort. It's only one hour, and you don't even need to leave your house and jump in your car and drive. In your house, at your dining room table, connect via Zoom, and it's only one hour, seven to eight. So make sure your heart is prepared. Notes will be emailed to you, but you can also re-listen on Facebook or YouTube, but notes will be emailed to you. So that is Wednesday at seven o'clock. And if you aren't able to make it, please message your house church leader. Because if the bulk can't make it on, on the Wednesday, then they could maybe change the meeting to the Thursday. But you must communicate with your house church leader. So that's this coming Wednesday. Then on Friday at 7 p.m. is a wonderful youth meeting. So, so far this year, we've had youth physically at this building at UKZN. But the next meeting on Friday is a Zoom meeting at 7 o'clock. Parents, we want to encourage you. We can't stress it enough. It's so important for children, your child, between 13 and 19 years old, to be in the house of God on a Friday night with youth. The, the youth leadership, they plan wonderful meetings, and there's lots of fun, there's a lot of games and laughter, but all, even the games are designed around the word. So when you finish play that game, you learn a principle from the word. So it's having fun in God. They will share. They do table of the Lord. They do, you know, little things. It's so interesting, the program. I wish I could come, but unfortunately, I'm not that age anymore. But I want to encourage you, ensure your child. They are on the youth WhatsApp group. So all the messages are sent there. So the parents may not see the message, but we are putting it on the church group. Encourage your child because the world out there, there are nightclubs, there are discounts, there are things that are happening with the young people. Not even in, in high school, in primary school, the stories we hear that we have to counsel of what they're engaging in at that age. They need a standard to live by. The standard is the word of God. And we as the house of God have to provide that standard for them. So it's so important that your child, don't let them have any excuse. It's only one hour via Zoom. And obviously, in her, uh, physically when they meet, which is the 24th again, on the 24th of March, the meeting will be here, a physical meeting. Don't even let transport be a reason because Ranoff and I are prepared and the youth leadership to come to your door and pick up your child and bring them here and take them home. So transport is not, that's how we realize the, the importance and significance of your youth gathering. When they go to school on a Monday morning, they're hearing from their friends, all the parties their friends were, and their worldly living and things they, the mischief they got up to. Let them say, well, we were in youth and this is what we did and we had fun. Let them have something to say too, that, oh, we did nothing. We had to wait for Sunday, all right? And Sunday is very important as well. So we meet next week Sunday at nine o'clock as well to hear the word of the Lord. And so, so that's youth on Friday at seven. And then Saturday morning is our weekly prayer meeting at 7 a.m., 7 a.m. to 7.45 via Zoom. These meetings are extremely powerful. It's like that's my daily dose. That's my vitamin C. That's my vitamin B, C, D, zinc. All of that because there are nuggets shared from God's word. And you may say, I'll be in church on Sunday, but that, in, that prayer meeting is so important because it's not just praying. You're hearing prophetic uh, utterances from pastor, uh, from Ranoff, and from anyone that, it's also free prophetic activation that you can 
if you have a word to share and you have an impression to share, that's a forum to even develop you prophetically and to activate you prophetically. So there's wonderful nuggets. So if you aren't, if you haven't been attending the Saturday morning prayer meetings, the recording is sent out afterwards. But don't let that be a reason we don't want to get up early and, and join the meeting. We'll wait for the recording. It's, it, there's nothing like being in that meeting and getting the impartation. And so, um, so that's Saturday morning. Then we meet again next week at 9. The birthdays for the week was three people, Nicholas, Cohen, and Lillian in Cape Town. So Lillian in Cape Town, we trust you had a wonderful day. We know Cohen would have been spoiled by Mama Katie. And uh, also Nicholas would have been spoiled by his new wife, Crystal. And so we... Um, we wish you well, and we know, we pray that the purposes of God be accomplished through your life as you continue to delight in his word, delight in his word. Then today after church, it's tea. It's our fellowship tea, which we have every second week. So we want to encourage everyone, including the visitors, not to rush off and go and leave. But just join us in the adjacent room where we're going to have Sunday school. Join us and just let's mingle and chat and have a lovely samosa and a drink and just engage each other because that's what family is about, communicating and building. And you know, the more time you spend with someone, the more you get to know them and the more your bonds are strengthened. And that's what we want. We want oneness in every, in every area because when the 120 were in the upper room, they were in oneness. They provided the context for the Holy Spirit to move. So let's always provide the context. We don't want the person in the third row to be tense with the person in the sixth row. And then there's a limitation on the move of the Holy Spirit. We want corporate oneness so the Holy Spirit can do his corporate work. But also when you're back home, still oneness in your biological family. Okay, and the Holy Spirit will work in your family all the time. And lastly, it's so wonderful to see Opa Esau. Opa Iso, stand up Opa Iso. Give this man a hand. You can sit down. He was here last week when Ranav called up the couples. Him and Mama Emma came up and they were holding hands and they were just being filled with the spirit and the next day he had a stroke. He couldn't say a sentence. He couldn't remember his name. And he went to hospital. And the church prayed because resurrection power flows amongst the sons of God. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the resurrection power. And guess what? In the hospital, God, power flowed through his being. And now he was discharged on which day? The Wednesday, the next day, accelerated healing. And people thought maybe this is it. He was shot in Bloemfontein, he survived. He went to hospital recently for an incident. He pulled through. He went again in a... Uh, this man's re the resurrection power of God just flowing through his being. He just goes to greet the nurses and share the good news, and he's out again. That's his ministry. Go impact the doctors and tell them Jesus loves them, and he's out. And how old are you? I'm 71. 71. Okay, so that resurrection power is yours and mine today. In your, in your workplace, in your home, in your university, your college, your school, your preschool, the resurrection power is there. The Holy Spirit is there for you. And these are signs that God's given us. Terence has been discharged, eh, Gail? We thank God. Terence has been on busy there. Terence in the wheelchair. We're going to call you up soon because you're going to walk out of that wheelchair. God's going to lengthen your legs and you're going to walk and you're going to dance around this pulpit. I believe it. Who believes it? Because God's power is here. God's power is real. He raises people from the dead. He activates barren wombs. He puts babies in barren wombs. He does so much. You just got to believe and trust him. Open your heart. Open your heart and receive. I'm excited today to even teach the Sunday school on the baptism, baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want the little child there to be full of the Spirit. And that is your portion. Your marriage can be re-infused because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Just open up. Provide the context for the Holy Spirit to move in your life. Don't let anything mar God's presence by having anger, bitterness, unforgiveness in your midst, impurity, carnality. Those are things that grieve the Spirit and limits the move on of the Spirit. So let's check our lives and welcome the Holy Spirit. So even as we welcome 
my handsome hubby, to come and share the word of the Lord with you. I pray that you open your heart to receive what the Spirit is saying to you. The Spirit is speaking through a human being, but listen to what the Spirit is saying. Amen. Bless you. Amen. The kids, you may leave. God bless you as you go to Sunday school. With Renee, I'm sure you're going to have a great time. Amen. 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 There's a wonderful sense of God's presence here. Amen. And um, I really want to encourage you to always be aware, um, if beyond the boundaries of a meeting, to be aware of the Spirit of the Lord in your daily life, in your personal life, in your normal work context. There is where the Spirit of the Lord wants to move in a very, very powerful, uh, in a very, very um, observable and measurable, measurable way. And so I really want to encourage you. We are hearing great testimonies of God's working in the midst of the saints, some of you here share with me some very powerful things in the week. Some of you, it's so powerful, we can't even speak about these things just yet. <laughs> Too powerful to mention. Some of you might just fall over just by hearing things. So, um, but God is simply, I'm so amazed at signs and wonders that follow the preaching of God's word. There are, uh, there's a powerful working in the midst of the life of the church right now. A lot of it is unseen, a lot of it we don't, and we cannot speak about right now. But the Lord is, the Lord is doing some extremely powerful things in the midst of us. In the same context, we must do nothing to abort the process. In the same way God is working, let's not take things for granted and start to relax principles and standards um, that will abort or limit the fullness of what God wants to do in and amongst us. So today, and maybe next week, we'll see how, how much I get through to today. I want to speak about personal purity and the Holy Spirit's power. Personal purity and the Holy Spirit's power. There's always a need to revisit personal purity, to come back to the issue as a reminder to the house of the things that we, we desperately need to take cognizance of and hear routinely, almost, almost repetitively on an ongoing basis. And so I want to encourage you here to um, focus on your personal life and make sure that within your construct, your mind, your flesh, there's nothing in you that might offend the Holy Ghost could literally cause him to retract. Um, he does retract. I know this. He does pull back um, when you provide a lifestyle that is in total antithesis, contradiction to everything that he is. Okay? Um, he will not abide in a context that is given to lasciviousness, profanity, um, the flesh, sexual indulgence, sensuality. Two words, I spoke to you this about two or three weeks ago. Some of you remember both here in the church and also I mentioned it in a recent prayer meeting. Two things we must watch in the season, sexuality and sensuality. Paul mentions two different concepts in his listing of deeds of the flesh. And he speaks about sexual sin, but he also speaks about sensuality. Um, the, the world presently is highly sexualized. And there's a great temptation and lure and pull upon us to bow to pressures of and to fall prey to sensual sin or sexual sin. It might not be sensual or sexual overtly, but it could be sensual and it's as offensive to the Holy Spirit um, as blatant overt sexual sin. What I want to encourage you is maintain your sexual purity. I want to speak a lot about this. Maintain your sexual purity before God. Maintain your sensual purity before God. I'll get into the mechanics of some of these things. I don't think I'll get into it now because of time. 
It's already uh, almost just five minutes past ten. But I really want to encourage us all to really guard, vociferously guard this area. Um, almost become um, obsessively guarded about this dynamic of your person. And be very, very careful in this season. Because some in the season will be lost. Hear me. Some in the season will be lost to the kingdom. If you don't heed this word. It's almost like you will walk down a path and you'll find it very difficult to get back to where you should be. So be very, very serious and be very, very um, intentional about keeping yourself pure. Tell your neighbor, keep yourself pure. And keep your, guard your heart and keep yourself pure at, at all terms. So let's just start to lay a foundation for some of these things. So today I'm just cast a foundation, and by the looks of things, I may get into some of the, what I really want to focus on and say, probably by next week. So Acts chapter 5 and verse 32 is a good starting point. How many people want more of the Holy Ghost? You want more of His power? I keep my both hands up. And I want to do nothing in my life to cause Him to retract or cause Him to become offended. And He's a, like I said, He's a Holy Spirit. He's not an unholy spirit. And holiness befits his person, and he's, he's compatible with the other who is holy, that's you and I, in whom he dwells. So he dwells in a temple. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's the housing of the Holy Spirit, and the venue that he elects to live in must be kept pure, must be swept clean, must be at all turns be kept holy as unto the Lord. So the apostle said this, we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. God has given to those who obey him. So everyone say obedience. So the more you can master obedience, I believe, the more you will find the degree of the Spirit's grace, anointing and function escalating in increasing measures within your life. Oppositely, embark upon a disobedient course and don't take it for granted that the Spirit will always be with you if you consistently disobey and walk down a path that will become offensive to Him. Obedience repels Him. Right? Disobedience repels Him. Obedience attracts Him. Right? Disobedience pushes Him away. But obedience sort of invites His presence. Because the Holy Spirit loves God's word. Repeat this after me. Say the Holy Spirit loves God's word. I don't have time to lay this out, but in the series on the extensive series on the Holy Spirit available on the YouTube channel, in COVID we did this, I demonstrated to you variously how that the Spirit always looks for word. Even in the book of Genesis, he hovered over waters, remember? And waters are symbolic representation of God's word. He hovers over the the waters in the beginning. Uh, the, the earth was without form and void. Darkness on the face of the deep. All of this is symbolic. Darkness, ignorance, covering the manifestation, face of the Father, which is the deep, right? And God said, let there be. And so the creative potential of the Lord was released by an utterance, and God formed cosmos from chaos. God started to put into order things. But it was the Spirit of God that sort of jumped on the bandwagon of the Word of God. Whenever God says, Spirit says, yes, Word going, I'm there. Right? Whenever Word is released, Spirit says, I'm there. I'm so attracted to the Word of God. Wherever I see Word, I become functional. Wherever I see Word, I become operative. Now, in the life of your being, you, the Son of God, must be so obedient to God's word. And when you do, the Spirit sees this and is naturally attracted to he who obeys the word of the Lord. You'll always find this. And there are many images and symbols of this throughout the Bible, throughout the scriptures. You will see a son who has become the word made flesh, manifested to the other, according to John 1 here, for those of you who know, in the beginning was the, the word, the word was, with God, the Word was God, verse 14, John 1, 14, and the Word became flesh, and the Word dwelt among us. 
right? We beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and, and truth, right? This word obeyed righteousness, came to John, asked John, baptize me. John says, you need to baptize me. Jesus said, no, suffer it to be so. Now, for in this way, I must, or rather he said, use the plural, we must fulfill all righteousness. And righteousness is compliance to God's eternal standards, preset from before time began. That's righteousness, right? There's a, a, almost 30 sessions on righteousness available on my website if you want to study the concept. But there I prove variously. I keep defining these things because these definitions need to stick into our minds. Righteousness is compliance. Everyone say compliance. compliance. Right? Um, Nolan's an electric, electrician. When you sell a house, you need an electrical compliance certificate. Right? To say that the wiring in the house is according to spec or standards that will satisfy any quality control inspection. So that the new buyer of the house is assured he's not buying a house where you put the light switch on and the thing blows up, right? Everything is good, right? Everyone say compliance to a standard, right? Now righteousness is compliance to a heavenly standard of how all sons of God on the earth should live according to predetermined principles, preset principles. You don't decide those principles. They are preset. They're predetermined. You must just know what they are and Comply and sink your life to agree. So when Jesus said to John, you baptize me. And he said, for in this way, it becomes all of us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus was saying, if you baptize me in water, what you are doing, John, I am thoroughly sinking my life to comply with an eternal standard that my father has set in the heavens. So I will obey. Jesus obeyed the water baptism doctrine or principle by an act of obedience and when he did the heavens opened only at his it's not about baptism per se that opens heavens it's about an act of obedience and when he came up out of the water you know the heavens opened and the father said this is my son in whom i'm well pleased and john said i saw the spirit of god alighting like a dove upon the spirit always comes upon the obedient son the Spirit always alights upon the compliant son. The Spirit always alights upon the son committed to righteousness. If you say righteousness, whatever the standard is, Lord, I comply. The Spirit says, I'm waiting for you, son. You do, I'm there. I alight upon you. I anoint you. I will, I will, I will come upon you and, and empower you for X, Y, Z. So I really want to encourage the house. Develop a culture of obedience. Right? And it's not what you think, because you don't decide what is righteous. I keep saying these buzzwords. Righteousness is predetermined. It's preset. It's not for you to, to determine the standard. The standard is there. Take your financial world. The standard is first fruits, tithes, various kinds of, of offerings, right? Those standards, you simply comply your life to in every act of obedience, you will see the power of the Holy Spirit even in your finances. You will see breakthroughs. You will see blessings. You will see things come into play. But we cannot simply uh, flagrantly, wishfully, wish the standard away and think, I'll, I know what the standard is, but I have an opinion. Whenever you set up your opinion to set aside the standard of God, right? Jeremy told us that selfishness. You're setting up your way to discount God's way. And that's pride at work. You're telling God, I'm bigger than you. I know better than you. Right? And that is the flesh standing in insurrection to a godly process. And when the spirit sees that, he simply lives. But when the spirit sees compliance to divine standard, the spirit will always support the obedient son. The Holy Spirit is under no obligation whatsoever to give enablement and support to disobedience. I want to say this again. Please read this register in our spirits. The Holy Spirit is under no obligation to give empowerment, enablement, or, to, or support 
to a disobedient son. Right? You can't tell me I will know the principle, I will do my own thing and expect the Spirit to anoint me thereafter. The Spirit will set us, the Spirit is such a gent gentleman. He is so sensitive. He's a thorough gentleman committed to process and principle. And the moment he sees the compliance to divine standards, order, rectitude, governance, he will back that up holistically. Okay? And now on the day of Pentecost, Peter would say we were all in one accord in one place. Not so? I'm quoting Acts 2, 1, verse 1 to 3 here. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Right? And they were gathered in the upper room and they heard the sound of a mighty rushing wind. Right? And the Holy Spirit fell and it filled the room where they were. You see, he respects one accordness, the Holy Spirit. We were all in one accord in one place. Where he sees one accordness, for example, no division. He will come, but he won't. He won't endorse a divided context by his presence. He won't give legitimacy to a, a divided context and come there to, so the observers can say we are divided as this, but see, we've got anointing. He doesn't do that because he respects principle so much, he will never violate God's word. So everyone say this, the Holy Spirit loves God's word. Say this, the Holy Spirit will enable the Son that obeys God's word, right? You see, the word must become flesh in your flesh. The word of God, John 1, became flesh and he dwelt amongst us. This word obeyed a principle. Heavens opened, the Holy Spirit descended upon the word of God in whom is fleshed out in the life of the Son of God. That's the, the principle. I'm telling you, you won't even have to pray much for him to increase his power in your life. If you simply upgrade your level of obedience, you'll find level of power, anointing, drastically increase. Huh? You will. I'm telling you, you will. Right? Um, it will be effortless because he does support obedience. Now, give the whole of scriptures I got you because of time. You can read this when you prepare for house church. Um, Oh, we looked at Samson a few, I don't know, years ago or months ago. I can't remember when now, but I want to revisit this. Samson had what we call operative in his life, the spirit of might. Now, everyone, like, make a bicep and stretch your, like, your forearm if you have one there <laughs> and say the spirit of might. All right? So uh, you'll find this in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Isaiah chapter 11. It says, this verse is not of Samson. This verse is prophetic of the Lord Jesus. A shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. A branch from his roots will bear. Jesse, the father of David, the Davidic line, right? Talking about Jesus coming from that line. A shoot will spring forth from the stem of Jesse. A branch from his roots will bear fruit, talking about the Messiah, the coming Messiah. And then it mentions seven spirits that will be operative in the life of Jesus and by implication and extension, all sons of God. Right? Number one, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, spirit of counsel, spirit of strength, spirit of knowledge, sixthly, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Put the NA to the King James. I know this one says spirit of strength here, right? Um, which in, in other versions, it's a spirit of might. Everyone say the spirit of might. Now, there are not seven spirits. There's one spirit with seven emanations, seven characteristics, if you would, seven expressions. If you know your Bible, in Revelation, it speaks of the seven eyes of the Lord, and it qualifies that these are the seven spirits that go throughout the earth. It's not that there are seven spirits. It's one Holy Spirit with seven predominant characteristics, right? So it's the fear of the Lord, or rather the spirit of the Lord, the Lordship. 
and I'll talk about that if time permits towards the end of this teaching. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. Um, Ralph Elliott did a brilliant teaching years ago. I was almost tempted to invite him again, which I think we must do. When he taught a series on the fear of God. I will never forget it. It was way back, very early in our relationship with him. Um, John Bevere has just launched his book called The Awe of God. It's, it's really taken the world by storm right now. Just released in last week. Um, I haven't got my copy yet, but I plan to get it and study it because I've tracked his teaching a few years ago on the subject. I think it's timely. Everyone say timely. These resources, these are things you spend your money on, brethren. Don't buy nonsense. Buy something that will instill the fear of God in you. And you awe, you stand in awe and wonder of God. You don't do things that detract from your sense of awe and wonder and your fear of Him. We're living in a day where people do not fear God anymore. Right? You can do X, Y, Z because you're so full of yourself. So full of your own mind, so full of your own opinion. You're discounting righteous standards of God. And by that disposition, you are basically communicating to any observer, I do not fear God. One of the spirits, one of the characteristics, one of the emanations, manifestations of the presence and person of the Holy Ghost is that you will fear God. Right? There are seven wonderful spirits here, and maybe sometime we must take each one and, and talk about it, you know. But many people love, for example, the spirit of, I want wisdom, I want understanding, I want the spirit of counsel to be in me, I want knowledge. Most people, I want the spirit of might, right? Many people say, I want the spirit of the fear of the Lord, where I fear God. Not negatively psychological fear of running away from Him, Right? John Bevere, uh, I've read a few of his posts relative to his book. He describes it as the fear is not a psychological fear of a negative threat that God will harm you. That's not the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to be so fearful of living without him and him lifting his presence from you, right? right? Lifting his presence from you. Kum books should have it. I'm not sure if they do it. Should have it soon. For those of you that are online digital readers get it for your kindle device or your pc buy it from amazon invest in resources that build into your library and make you the person that god wants you to be right so bump your neighbor and say whatever you do don't lose the fear of god right? don't lose the fear of god david said in psalm 51 when he when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And the murder of her wife, of his, of his, of her husband, Uriah, remember? And he repents. You know what he says? Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Take not your spirit from me. Don't lift your spirit from off of me, God. It was that he feared the most. That God would take his spirit away from him. And in his psalm, he repents. God, please forgive me. For David, going to hell is not an issue. <laughs> he said, for even in hell, there your spirit will fight me. Where can I go from your presence? Where can I run from your, even if I make my bed in hell. But for him, the greatest fear is not there. It's living on earth in hell. And his definition of hell while living is when God lives his presence. And then you're left to yourself to face this treacherous world. Now, this spirit, one of the seven spirits, the fear of the Lord is very important. But let's just look at Samson, how that one of the seven spirits was overtly manifested in his life, and that was the spirit of might. Because Samson is Samson, right? He is this big, macho man that can kill a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an X, of an S, Right? He offended them. You must read the story. I read it again last night. Just read the account. And he, he did something to offend them. They marshaled up against him. He, was, he felt vulnerable. He had no weapons. He found a chalkboard of an ass on the floor. He just took that. And he killed a thousand men with it. You know? A mighty man. 
man that can carry city gates on his back, just pick them up and move them. You know? The spirit of extraordinary might and power was upon him. Sadly to say, he lost the fear of the Lord. Right? He had one dynamic of the spirit flowing, but the other, the fear of the Lord, was sadly lacking. Rosh Peters, um, yeah, we have one of our sons in the house, has written a brilliant book on the seven emanations, I think it's called. The seven emanations on the spirit of the Lord. I have a few in my office, if some of you want, where she discusses each of these. And she is convinced the spirit of the fear of the Lord is the basis for all the others. Once you get the fear of the Lord right, all the others will start to, to flow miraculously. So as you know, the book of Judges has 12 judges. The book of Judges in the Old Testament, well, 13 technically if you count Samuel, because the Bible calls him the last judge, although he's not in the book of Judges, he's in the book of uh, Samuel. But, and then if you distinguish between Deborah and Kor and uh, Barak, they operated simultaneously in, in concert, but many people distinguish them. But most theologians will tell you there are 12 judges in the book of Judges, including Samuel being a 13th. Sadly, the, the legacy of that period is whenever Israel served God, they were happy and God's blessing would be upon it. Then they would go away from God and there's a spiritual decline. Then God will have to stir someone up, let's say like Othniel or Japheth or, or Gideon, Gideon the Midianites, or people like Deborah and Barak. Uh, another way, this guy Samson, Jehiel and others. And they would they would deal with an enemy, then Israel would be restored to a life of prosperity. And then in the life of the judge, they would serve God, as long as the judge was alive. For example, we would say like, and Israel after, I think it was Gideon had 40 years rest. Right? And then they go into spiritual decline, and God raises up an enemy to judge them. They cry to the Lord. God raises up a judge to deliver them. That process repeats itself over a couple of hundred years. Right? And the sad reality, the sad end of the book of Judges. Can you get the last verse in the last chapter? I'm not sure. What is it? The last verse of Judges in the last chapter of, of Judges. Sad ending to a whole book, a whole narrative of God using powerful individuals over a period of time to secure his purposes. Yet the people did not learn consistent fear, consistent um, faithfulness. In those days, this is how the book ends. After 21 chapters of this yo-yo kind of experience, a lot of people feel it's a failed apostolic mood. 12, the apostolic, 12 judges, a failed leadership, could not entrench principles in people. So the legacy is in those days, there was no king and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And I want to encourage you here, stop the tendency to decide what's right in your eyes and simply comply with already predetermined righteous standards that have been set for you by the Lord. There are standards for how you should relate to a spiritual father. There are standards for how you should relate to your brothers. There are standards for how you should relate to your boss at work. Colossians and Ephesians talks about the workplace ethics. Paul was very emphatic about these things. There are standards about how you should behave to someone that hurt you and offend you. There are standards of forgiveness. You can't just decide, well, I know that, but I will pursue this. No, you're doing what's right in your eyes, and it's proof, no king in your life. King's oil, there's no standard. There's, you don't regard a king, so you do what's right in your eyes. So that's the legacy of the book of Judges. Very, very sad legacy. So we can't go through each judge, and we can but we don't have the time. <laughs> but just take Samson. God raises him up as one of these judges. And for example, each of them will deal with different enemies, like Gideon will deal with Midianites, right? The spirit of strife and contention. God raises this man up of peace. One is 300. He'll deal with this enemy. In Samson's era, it was a Philistine problem. Everyone say Philistine. Now, as you know, the word Philistine means rolling in the dust wallowing. The word Philistine means to roll in the dust or to wallow. So it is an expression of unbridled, self-indulgent carnality. 
because dust is symbolic of the flesh. How was man made from the dust of the earth, right? The, the, the curse on Satan, one of it was, you, on your belly, you will crawl and you will eat dust all your life, right? Man was made from dust. Paul would use the same symbol as an expression of carnality. My son Matthew has a whole teaching on dust. One of the first messages he ever preached, but those of you remember, I remember back in the day. He took the concept and he really laid it out. But you can look at his website and get his notes. He actually got an old note on, 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 the, on the issue. So dust is Satan's food. On your belly you will crawl and you will eat dust. Wherever there's dust, Satan thrives. Because he feeds on human carnality and human expressions of self-indulgent pleasure. You're wallowing and you're rolling in the dust. It's a Philistine problem you have. And God wants to deal with the Philistine in you. God, and it is intolerable of you adopting any kind of position that would, that would um, cause him to share room. When the Ark of the Covenant was taken from Israel, remember? Whose reign was it? King Saul, was it? Yeah. My memory serves me correct. Remember, who, who stole the Ark of the Covenant? The Philistines, not so? Eli, sorry, I beg your pardon. In Eli's time, not King Saul. Eli the high priest, remember? Right? And the Philistines attacked. Remember, there was wickedness in Eli's house in reference to his own sons, Hophni and Phineas. The Bible calls them sons, wicked sons, worthless fellows, King James. It's debased, right? Sons of the flesh. They, should, they had a powerful lineage and herit, a heritage in that they were sons of a high priest. But, and I, I mentioned this in my first fruits book where I caution leaders about how to administrate first fruits because in that chapter that I mentioned in the book, it says that Israel brought the choices of the things from the land. The first fruit, the word choices, reshit, the choices of the land, and they brought it to the temple. And who received it then? As recipients, it was Hophni and Phineas, right? So when later God called Eli to reprimand him, God said to him, you honor your sons more than me, right? For indeed, God said this, they kick at my first fruits, right? They disdain my offerings. Simultaneously, in other words, the word, I, I, I explained this quite extensively in the book. It, it means they use it for self-indulgent, self-satisfactory pleasures, and they did it deplorably, right? God hated them. I hate what they are doing. Simultaneously, as women came to give this, they would coerce the women to sleep with them at the temple gate. So this level of flesh and level of carnality is creeping into the holy precincts, even where first fruits and other offerings are governed at the temple entrance. This is the gateway to glory. But here you are, you are, you are consorting and manifesting very, very, very overtly with issues of sexual indulgence and carnality in the same context where the holy glory of the Lord should be abiding. Right? So, the Philistines, God raises them up to judge Israel. They attack Israel and they took the ark of the covenant where the glory of the Lord resided between the two cherubs. They took that holy article to their territory. Remember the story? When they took it to the Philistine country, they put the Ark of the Covenant in the same temple of worship that the Philistine god Dagon was kept. And they put the Ark of the Covenant side by side. The next morning when they got up, Dagon was flat on his face. Right? And they tried to work this out, and they came to the conclusion, it's because of the Ark of the Covenant. God will not tolerate abiding in a principality of the flesh in the same context. Right? 
Remember what is it? It's not just Dagon. Dagon is the, the Dagon is the principality, he's the demonic host that the whole Philistines are worshipping. And the word Philistine means to wallow in the dust, to roll in the dust, to give yourself over to fleshly indulgence and fleshly carnality. And when you try to accommodate both positions in the same temple, one must fall. God says, I'm not falling. That thing has got to crumble. That God has got to fall flat on its back. Even as I'm speaking to you here, those of you watching by live stream, Dagon is falling in your life. I can see it. Because some of you are, are, are you're trying to accommodate two positions in the same temple. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And God says, if any man profane the temple of, the go of, the whole, of, of, of God, I will, him will God destroy. I'm quoting 1 Corinthians chapter 6 here. If any man profanes the temple, him will God destroy. And I want to encourage you here. Uh, this word will set you free. God is now, because some of you have this tendency of, it's like a yo-yo kind of thing. It's like the season of the judges. Because you haven't installed the king. So you, you need a deliverer every now and then. You need a judge every now and then. But when a king comes, there's consistent levels of breakthrough. Not so. Because you, you, bow to, you bow to principled authority that ensures sustained victory within, within our lives. So, Samson, unfortunately, God raises to deal with this thing called Philistine. God says, you might judge. And, you know, the book of Judges... It's called the book of Judges because God wants to judge things. God is saying enough is enough. I stand as judge and I set the matter right. I put the thing right. Amen. And I really want to encourage you. God loves you. Remind, please remind someone next to you. God loves you. And that's why he's speaking to you like this. God loves you. God loves me. That's why he's speaking to me in this, in this fashion. So, there's clear evidence in the book of Judges. Um, look at Judges chapter 13, verse 25a. The Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him. This is Samson. So he knew the Spirit of the Lord, right? Spirit of the Lord began to stir him, this version says. Look at chapter 14 and verse 19a. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, right? Came upon him mightily, and he went down to to Ashkelon, and he killed 30 of them, right? This is when he gave them that riddle about the honey in the lion's carcass. You know the story, right? And they couldn't work it out. And um, through um, the girl that he was cavorting with, they managed to extract the information. And he was so enraged, right? And he went down and he, he killed 30 Philistines, took the spoil to, to, um, to pay these people, right? Look at Judges chapter 15 and verse 14. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines shouted as they met him. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, so that the ropes on his arms were like flax that burned with fire. And his bonds dropped from his hands, the chain. And he, he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, an ass, and he reached out and he took it and he killed a thousand men with it. This guy's a bad guy. You know, I'm using colloquial terms. Bad in this context means very powerful. <laughs> very good, good, bad. Bad, good, however you say it. So you don't play with Samson. He take you out. The tier of a thousand of you, no problem. No sword, nothing. Job out of an axe. Come with all your weapons. Sp when the spirit, and let me just say this to you. The spirit of might is something I'm really focusing on. We're going to see the power and might of the Lord break upon us in this house. The spirit of might it will, will cause you to do extraordinary things for God. Unfortunately, you know Samson's story, right? What was his great weakness? His flesh. What was his great weakness? Right? His lust. He saw women and he lusted after them. Right? Eventually, eventually the woman Delilah, 
led to his demise. Be careful of who you dalela with. Don't dalela with Delilah. She'll cause your demise. Right? Um, and you know, it's, it's so um, sad for me when I, when I read the story of, of Delilah. He, he was caused to defeat the Philistines, but he played the harlot with them. He was forced, he was caused, you know he had a Nazarite vow, Samson did? And the Nazarite vow, amongst many things, means that he could not cut his hair, which signified the glory of the Lord. Right? The power was not in the hair. The power was in an act of obedience. Right? So he also could not touch any dead thing. Right? So when that lion came and he killed that lion, and when he passed by there the next day, there was honey in the carcass of the lion. He went and he ate the honey from the dead carcass of the lion, remember? Could, should not have done that. Because the Nazarite vow said you don't touch anything dead so you see what he did he knew principles but he thought it's not so bad i mean honey is in the carcass of the lion i really want the sweet stuff but i need to touch the dead stuff to get the sweet stuff <laughs> don't touch the dead stuff to get the sweet stuff some of you want to appease your appetite but you're killing yourself in the process you're destroying your destiny Right? All you want is sweet honey. But little do you know. And you know, no one comes to their demise overnight. When Samson finally falls, it's not that. It's a track, a progressive journey of subtle points of flagrant disregard for known principles. I don't have time to look into him in detail. But if you track his journey and how, he, how it led to the Philistines capturing him. When, when Delilah cut his hair off, remember? A, 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 a symbol of his power. And they came upon him. And they gouged his, his eyes out. And they put him to, to turn him. I think it was a mill or something. He went round and round. That's all that's from the great judge, spirit of might, reduced to an activity that meant nothing to heaven. Contributing nothing to God's purposes. But you, you, you're there to entertain your enemy now. The enemy you don't destroy, the enemy will use you for its own entertainment. Very, be very careful of this. The enemy that you don't rise up against. Let me just say, I'm speaking to you like this because I'm talking to Randolph. I'm talking to myself. You know the thing you should deal with. You know the thing in your flesh that trips you up every, every time. You know. All I'm saying to you in this season, have a militancy about you. Say, I'm, I've been warned enough. I'm not just going to take it for granted that there will always be a next week Sunday morning at gate where we come in and we enjoy songs and presents. Don't take things for granted. The Holy Spirit doesn't just lift and go. He lifts progressively. He checks you out to see after several warnings, will you... Will you adjust your ways? Will you adjust your ways? Samson, unfortunately, did not heed the warning of the Lord through several, several instances. Delilah, oh, by the way, how many, now, how many times did she try to get the secret out of him? Four times. She succeeded on the fourth one. I would think, by the second one, Samson, wake up, bro. Wake up. Can't you see? Every time you give her the secret of your power, which is not true, she calls Philistines to attack you. You wake up and you deal with it. Happens a second time. Maybe by the third time, at least, bro, open your eyes. And yeah, I want to say this to the house. Some of you need a wake-up call. You can see already how your, cons how your present system of disobedience is leading to your destruction. You can see it. The, the, the evidence, the signs are all over your life. But you continue. Right? They say the height of insanity is to do the same thing expecting different results. Right? You're doing the same thing in the flesh, but you want different results. It's not going to happen. 
right? We need to come to our senses. The prodigal son in the pigsty came to himself, the Bible says, and came to his senses and said, In my father's house, the servants live better than, than I am. I, 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 I don't want to get away from this point too quickly. I want to encourage you all, and I speak to myself as well. Watch, watch a pattern of repetitive disobedience around a particular principle. And watch how God is so faithful to give you adequate warnings along the way that, hey, bro, sister, mother, father, young girl, young boy, teenager, you need to note this, that if you continue like this, your life will come to nothing. Today, God is, God is restoring, and God's mercy and redemption is here, I really believe. Today is like God, for many of you, saying one last warning. For many of you. Because the Bible says he, somewhere in my notes, he who often being reproved hardens his heart shall be cut off and that without remedy. Quoting King James, it's a dangerous scripture. That I'll find it somewhere in the notes I'll, I'll share with you later. He who often, everyone say often being reproved, hardens his heart shall eventually be cut off and that without remedy, without possible redemption. It's a very, very dangerous place to live. Talk to Judas. Talk to Judas. You know, John 13, I, I share this with you. If you can find it for me, Karen. John 13, in the first few parts of that chapter, I think it's verse 2 or 3, where the Bible says that Satan put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. Right? Where did the thought come from, let me betray Jesus? Right? Look at this. And please remember, it's during supper, brethren. Supper, the Lord's Supper. This is the final table of the Lord, communion that Jesus is having with these 12 before you go to the cross. Right? In holy precincts, the devil is operative. In a holy community of saints, breaking of bread, table of the Lord, grace is being communicated. You see, you can be in this environment, but you can give Satan license to play havoc with your mind. You don't allow him that. Amen? Your mind belongs to Christ. Don't allow the enemy to run, to, to play games with satanic insertions of thoughts that violate righteous standards. I'm amazed that our people can sit with attitude. And I use the word carefully, Pastor Thoma loves using this word. With attitude in God's house. Right? To sit there angry. Most times at me. <laughs> or whoever's preaching. How dare you say that? You don't say that, but in your heart you're saying it. How can you say that? How can they do this? How can? Attitude. It's satanic suggestions within the precincts of the holiness of God. If you can find it for me right at the end, I'm not sure what verse it is, where the Bible says, and Satan entered him. Right? You see, yeah, he's putting it into his heart. The word heart could be substituted for thought. But right towards the bottom of this chapter, if he, he accommodated the thought too long, and if you accommodate a satanic thought too long, it can lead to a wholesale satanic possession. Now, when Satan enters him, there's no turning back after that. And Jesus realizes this. And Jesus said to him, it's fine now, too late. Whatever you do, do it quickly. Go for it, Judas. Go for it. Run with this new thing you're doing. The Bible says, he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is unrighteous, let him be unrighteous still. I'm saying this it might not be applicable to all of you. But if you are going to be righteous, I tell you, go for it. If you are going to be unrighteous, go for it too. Whatever you want, give yourself to it and master it. If you want your way, have it. But don't blame God after this. Right? But don't come at the end of a process when things go horribly wrong 
Now, we're always here to pick up pieces. That we'll, we always do until Jesus comes. Right? We're always here to pick up pieces and to salvage. But I'm, I'm saying we are living in such a dangerous season where the sexualization of the world and the sensualization of the world has gotten to a new level. You can't even put on Netflix today and you search to get a decent film to watch. You can't even watch anything without some suggestion of sexual innuendo and in some cases most explicit sexual scenes that you have to watch yourself. Now, I'm speaking to this house. I'm saying to this house, keep yourself pure. Don't make the mistake that it's simply entertainment. The Bible says this, that Job, his soul was vexed. Not Job. Who was the guy? Lot. Lot's soul was vexed by the things he heard and the things he saw in Sodom. Peter, in the book of 1 Peter, says this. Right? His soul was vexed. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. The old Sunday's little song. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. We just sing these songs. Don't think, listen to me, all of you. Don't think it inconsequential. If you give yourself over to sexual images over a period of time, that that's not going to impact you. It will negatively affect you. Okay? So bump your neighbor and say, keep your eyes pure. You can't even search even things like Instagram, Facebook today. Sexual images are all over the place. You just turn any device, boom, boom. It's like bombarding you from all sides. And the Lord spoke to me and said to warn the house, this is the methodology and the intention of Satan, him, Satan himself, to wear you down. But you don't realize it because you think you're deriving entertainment value. For you, it's innocent. But you can't be entertained by what God abhors. You can't adore what God abhors. You can't be entertained by that which is an anathema to God. God detests it. I can't love it. I cannot agree with what is so disagreeable to the nature of God himself. I'm shocked today how many people are giving themselves over to be entertained by homosexual programs, by lesbian programs. You think it tickles your flesh. Be careful when Delilah strokes you on her lap and lulls you into a place where you can't even fight back and you give away secrets of the kingdom. Be careful of these things, brethren. You know what the word Delilah means? To bring low. I, Samson, I want to talk to you one day, bro. How can you court a girl Whose destiny means I will bring you low. How, what got into you? Yes, you know, he was the first sort of girl you read in his account that he went to marry. Remember the first occasion? The Bible says he just saw a lady. And the Bible says it appealed to his physical, uh, physicality appealed to him. And he arranged, almost forced his father to arrange the marriage. And then that didn't thing work, that didn't work out. And it was problems with Philistines, etc. And then he went down, I think, to Sorek, a valley. Don't go to a valley <laughs> to find a wife. Go to a mountaintop at least. <laughs> you know, and he sees Delilah and he's smitten. He's smitten. So I get this image of she's sitting there and he's lying on his on her lap. Her long hair flowing, right? She's busy, busy stroking him, right? But what she is doing, she's wearing away his spiritual resolve progressively over time. Until such time that he's, he will give away the secrets of the kingdom. Now the Bible says, I can't remember where it is. Look at Judges chapter 16 and verse 20. I'm going to have to continue this. Time is just gone. It gallops on a Sunday morning. Judges 16 verse 20. So this is the fourth occasion, the fourth attempt, and she succeeds. He says, the secret is my hair, right? She cuts her hair, and then she makes a routine announcement. The Philistines are upon you, Samson. He awoke from his sleep. And this is, look at the foolishness of, of self-deception. He says, I will go out as in other times. I will shake myself free. 
I mean, I did it to bands tied upon me. I can carry gates. I can kill Philistines, a thousand of them with the jawbone of an axe. I can burn a whole Philistine field by setting the tails of foxes alight and tying them together. I have a track record of the Spirit coming mightily upon me. And the Bible says, he says, my record gives me legitimacy to function now. Don't ever make that mistake. Don't ever make the mistake of see how God has used me in the past. This is par for the course. And you do that in the mindset of I will relax principles. It will be as before. We'll go out. You know what? To, to use local parlance, he's saying, I will shake myself. I will do my thing once again. Samson's time to arise. We are these Philistines. One more battle. One more victory. I will go out as in other times and shake myself free. But, everyone say but. Spirit by that stage says enough is enough. I lift. He did not know that the Spirit, or that the Lord had departed from him. And the rest is quite tragic. He goes out and you know the story. He's enslaved. His eyes are, are gouged out. Um, he repents. Who's grateful for the mercy of God? <laughs> I'm so grateful that God is merciful. He was merciful to Samson. Do you know Samson is in Hebrews 11? Time, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, after mentioning a few people, he says, and time will not permit me to tell you of Gideon, of Deborah, of Barak, of Samson. Samson made it into Hebrews 11. <laughs> tell, you, tell somebody, you've got to make it into the records. <laughs> I know for some of you, you might feel it's gone so far, right? I'm even in a worse place than Samson, Pastor. Listen, you're here. It's fine. Tell someone it's fine. I don't want to, I don't want to, I want to be serious, but simultaneously, I don't want anyone to leave here with a point of despair and saying there's no hope for me. No, there's hope for everybody. Come and just tell the, the person next to you, you, because you are here, there's hope. Because you are here, there's hope. And no, many of us are hearing this message. And this is not so much a prohibition as much as it is an empowerment. You're being empowered to face battles that are that you're going to lure you. Well, attempt, Satan will attempt to lure you into a, a vice grip from which you possibly could not be freed. He's saying, yeah, let them bind me however they want to. I know how to free myself. I'll come out of any vice grip. But he did not know by that stage the spirit had lifted, had lifted from him. So the Philistine lords held this final feast. You know the story. And I think there were about 3,000 of them, or 1,000 of them. I can't remember how many. My memory just fails me now. In any case, there were thousands there in the, in, the, in the feast. And he basically says, God, remember me. Remember we said the Lord remembered Samson? One of the prayer meetings. God remembered Hannah. God remembered Sarah, Rebecca. All the other ladies, God remembered Noah. God remembered Samson. He said, Lord, he cried, Lord, remember me. Remember me. And you know what the Bible says? I'm, I'm paraphrasing what he would have said to the Lord. He's saying, Lord, one more time. One more chance to do your will in the earth by taking out an enemy of your people. Let your people be safe. Let me, in my tenure of judge, which for him was 20 years, he served as a 20-year period as a judge. A lot of the guys served 40 and others, even some less than 20. But he comes less than what was typically the rule of, the, of his era. And he calls a lad. Remember Ralph Elliott's word to this house? The lad principle? A few years ago, we invited Ralph Elliott, and he gave us a very strong prophetic word that this house is called a lad in the spirit. And he, and he extrapolated the lad principle very straight out the truth. Remember, and Abraham and the lad went up the mountain. And he, he went and he went on. And he came to this section on Samson. And he said to this house, this house is a lad in the spirit. And he said to us, I'll never forget this. He said, this house is called to stand alongside the Samsons of this age. And to take their hands. And to direct their hands to pillars. To give one last mighty feat for the kingdom. And in the process, to have the greatest victory in Samson's record. Because Samson asked a little boy, a lad, see, because he couldn't see it. So he said, take my hands and lead me and guide me 
You see, his hair grew back without the, the perception of the Philistine lords. Everyone say lords. That's very, it's not just Philistines present. Who was present at this gathering? It's not just ordinary Philistine. These are Philistine lords. These are the, the, the basic leadership component of the entire Philistine entity present at this. You take these guys out, you neutralize the whole, the whole nation. Now please say this, lords. You know some of you are not just going to defeat that principality that, that keeps you in traps. Some of us are going to defeat the leader of the pack. The leader of the pack. This is very, very serious. I dealt with the, this is where we were so tired, late last night, a counseling session. And by the spirit of discernment, I said to the person, yeah, it's not just one demon. Yeah, it's a cluster. They are dogs. They are wolves. They, they, they journey in packs. And we took authority over the, the principality in the name of Jesus. In my office, took authority over that thing. Let me just say this to all of you. You got to get the victory, not just for you. You have got to get the victory for everyone in your sphere too. Right? This is not just an absolving for Samson. He's not just saying, Lord, remember me one more time. Let me, be, let me go down in the records as having killed Philistines. He's not saying that. He's saying, God, I'm tired of dealing with the Philistines. I want the lords now. I want the hierarchy. I want the top end. I want to take out their leadership. But he realized, to do that, I have to die too. And his mindset is, I don't mind my legacy being in his death. And this is recorded in the book of Judges. In his death, he killed more Philistines than he did in his entire life. Right? But it's not literally the number, because in dealing, he killed less by number that night. But it's what he killed. It's, it's the quality of what he killed that could have recorded that legacy about him. You know, I'm feeling so empowered right now. I can feel the Lord talking even to me about certain things. Randolph, in the places where you die, I can work. If you are prepared to die to your stubbornness, to your own way, to your own disobedience, to your inclination, the moment Samson was prepared to live in the culture of death to his flesh was the greatest expression of divine victory in his life. You see, because while he lived, he appeased his flesh and he had a certain level of victory. But in the place, the day in which he died, he proved that God's spirit would come back and do the greatest work in his entire life. But it happened in the place where he died. Where you die, when you die, you will have the greatest victories. And when I speak about death, I'm not talking physical death. I'm talking death to your flesh. Paul speaks about dying to self. Dying, for example, in Galatians, to the old nature of, the old nature of sin. The moment you're prepared to die to these things, you will sense victory that, like you've never, ever sensed before brethren so i want to warn us today there's so many things i want to say but we can't right now i want to just sound out a warning this word is a warning to this house and to those watching via live stream to all those that follow and to all the other churches that i provide spiritual oversight to i want to encourage us all if ever there's going to be a buzzword that must, must be fit you it's purity don't take it for granted that the spirit will always be with you in seasons when he's routinely and repetitively announced it to you. I want to leave you two, two more important scriptures before I close. Last week I said to you Proverbs 10 verse 5. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son. But he who sleeps in harvest is the one who brings shame. I'll, I'll demonstrate this to you more definitively maybe next week. But listen to the principle. One of the images of sleep in the Bible is when one gives one's life over to the works of your flesh. 
if, you, if you're taking notes, the record is in Romans chapter 13, verse 11 to 14. I won't read it now because of time. But Paul there equates the condition of sleep to one being given over to the works of the flesh. So if you are asleep, it means you, part of the application is being given over to the works of the flesh. But you bring shame as a son because you will never access your harvest. Right? Your harvest will be aborted. Right? And there's one very other important verse of Scripture. That I want to close with, and you must we must pray over. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 23. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 23. It says the following: Turn to my reproof. And behold, I will pour out my spirit upon you, and I will make my words known to you. The word turn here is basically repent, to turn, shop. Turn at my Reproof. Everyone say reproof. Okay. Now, don't sit there, brethren, and say, I'm so glad this, my other friend is in the meeting. It was, this word is just for him. Sure. I'm so glad the other sister's here. Sure. Thank you, Lord. You spoke to them. Sure. No, this word is for all of us. In fact, this word is for Randall, most particularly. All right? Just remind someone, this is your word today. This is your word. This is your word today. Don't be stroked by Delilah and be lulled into a false sense of security. You take things for granted. I have a history of anointing. I will arise and do my thing as in times before. It's not going to happen, brethren. I also want to sound out a warning. I want all of our young people and courting couples, you must court accurately. You do not be unequally yoked with the world. Right? Do not align yourself to someone that does not know Christ, right? You're courting problems, right? Even if they are Christian, make sure that they're properly Christian. It's not everybody that has that label is fine, you know? Make sure that they are the Son of God, uh, manifesting the, the ways of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. amen. Say amen. Come on. Amen. Say yes. yes. God has spoken. Amen. I feel like singing that song. Let the church say amen on the cross. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Amen. Stand with me. The team come join me. We, we shan't be long, too long. And let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Let the church, let the church say amen. God has spoken, let the church say amen. Let the church, let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Come on, God has spoken. God has spoken. Let the church come on, lift your hands. Let the church say, Amen. Come on, say Amen to His word. Let the church say, Amen. God has let the church say amen. One more time. Let the church. Let the church say amen. Oh yes. Let the church say amen. God has the church say 
lift your hands to the Lord. Lord, I offer my life to you. Everything I've been through, use it for your glory. Lord, I offer my days to you, lifting my praise to you as a pleasing sound. Dedicate, recommit our lives to purity. The Bible says in the book of Romans that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power through the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Everyone say the Spirit of holiness. That's the Holy Spirit. He's called the Spirit of holiness. And wherever he is, where we have died, there will be a resurrection of things. I really believe that with all of my heart. Many of you, as you've listened to the word, have already repented. You've already said sorry to God for your sin. I declare to you, your sins are forgiven you. There is therefore now no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus. Now that your sin is forgiven, that principality, that Philistine Lord, does not have legitimate right to oppress you any longer. Lift up your hands. Everyone close your eyes. Lift up your hands. In the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, I serve notice to every prince that is foreign and alien to the nature of God in the lives of the people of God I dislodge you now in Jesus name and I send you to the abyss where you belong no longer will you help hold captive the house of God and the people of God in their personal lives I set the sons of God free from any bondage from any inclination from any habit that imprisons and that binds. I set you free, Son of God, in the authority of Jesus Christ, even now in Jesus' name. I, I prophesy and speak over you that the enemy you are designed to destroy will not rule over you. For you were raised up in this season to destroy that Lord, to destroy that Philistine in the name of Jesus. No longer will you wallow in the flesh. No longer will you wallow in the mud of carnality. This day, declares the Lord, I call you again, my son and my daughter, back to righteousness, back to the fear of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, lift your voice and just, just worship the Lord. So we wait for your hope.
of purity before the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let the church say amen. amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. Let the church say amen to the speaking of the Lord. Obviously, you will process the final details of this at House Church. And how are these things? At House Church, what I really would like this week is as in your discussions, process this information. But I want, I want personal testimonies. I want subjective witness. How is this word working for you? How, and even if you feel vulnerable, it's fine. Because House Church is a safe platform to share your heart without being judged. If you say to your leader or to your group, guys, pray for me. I'm really struggling with this. You must. This is the house of God. If we can't share this here, yeah, where else can we share it? This is the place we run to to get, to get help. If anyone would like to speak to us personally, please you're more than welcome. So it's, 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 you're more than welcome to, to speak to us directly as well. Amen. Um, this week, Renee and I leave for Santon. We leave on Tuesday. We're attending the POA, Perspectives on the Apostolic, with Joseph Matera. Um, and so we are going to be staying over for their meeting that Kate Santon is hosting on Friday and Saturday. They're hosting... The same speaker in the conference, so we'll be there on the Friday and the Saturday. And they will leave to come back after the last session on the Saturday. So we're back in time for part two of the series. See how much I love you. Actually, come here for part two. <laughs> I I've stayed there for the Sunday morning. Amen. Um, on Wednesday, I would encourage you, if you have time in the day, if you have time in the day, it's from 8.30 to 1.30. All of these broadcasts are live streamed. I think it'll be on this will definitely be on Tamunaidu, uh, the Tamunaidu YouTube channel. And I think the meetings with, uh, on the weekend will be on the Gate Center YouTube channel. 
Either way, you'll get the link. Um, if you can, pitch in. But um, many of us, who was there when Joseph ministered at ALS? Remember we cried? <laughs> cried in that session. Uh, the one session he took, he spoke on generational curses and generational blessings, remember? Oh, I've never cried in a leadership meeting like that before. Uh, but And then I bought his book immediately, Generational Blessings, is one of his pet topics. But I'm not sure what exactly the focus will be uh, this time, amen, but um, we will be going. So please keep us in prayer as well. We'll be driving there and, and driving back as well, amen. So great grace and abundant peace be with you. I'll try and adjust these now somewhat because a lot of things came forth here prophetically that I didn't plan. That's why I say, let the church say amen, because God has spoken. Because some of the things I've said were unpremeditated. And I know the spontaneous speakings of the Lord when these things do happen. So let's, let's proceed to...